Okay, so let's go ahead and finish a little bit of Renaissance art, and I'll give you a little bit of time to read. We got a bunch of people gone, so they're going to miss why Night Spot Snails, and that's their loss, not mine. Sistine Chapel. Remember, we went through Renaissance art, went through Giotto, Masaccio. Um, who did the birth of Venus? Uh, ah, very good. Uh, that was a thing. I don't know. Look it up. Tip of your tongue. Who? You're close there. Someone said it. Want to tell you, yes. And then Don, uh, who did the David statue? The, the, the skinny yeah. David. Exactly. Michael Angelo. No, Michael Angelo did the kind of, we're going to use it all mannerisms. Yeah. And then who's the first one to really experiment with perspective? Who? Even before Da Vinci, even Da Vinci, you really start seeing the perspective and triangles and shapes. Yeah, Giotto? yeah, Giotto. And so we went. Let's get back to the Sistine Chapel. So remember, Michelangelo was a sculptor. He did David, amazing sculptors, but he was by the, the warrior Pope Julius to do the Sistine Chapel. And we'll get to the colors in a second. But these are frescoes. And I think I did the drop of the bell rang how they played. Plastered out, it's plaster, wet plaster, then you literally paint on the plaster. And that's what they do. And it is this massive chapel, not near as big as St. Peter's. And if you want to see crowds, go see this. And for years, the color had been degraded up into the 1990s. You can imagine years of having candles and surfaces in there, the smoke. And then up until the 1990s, I mean, everybody would go in there smoking a cigarette. And so they went back and they redid it, the painting. We cleaned it very carefully, like inch by inch, carefully. And it is so vibrant now. So that's great you're able to say that. And it tells the story of the saga of Genesis in the, 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 the Christian church, in the Christian Bible, but also for the Torah, it also works for the Quran. And it's absolutely amazing. Here is the creation of Adam, one of the more famous bits. And oh, so let me get to. So the Vatican has put out a 3D model of this, and it is awesome. Now, if you go to this and you get your time, you wait in line, then go in, it's just a mob of people. I mean, literally shoulder to shoulder. Well, not now. Italy has pretty strict COVID restrictions. But before that, we're watching this all at home. And but they put this off a few years ago. This is just—it's so cool. I should have. Hopefully, they're talking about getting rid of it. Um, maybe opening it up. They, they're talking if Omicron is the uh, endemic one, which is not great. But at least maybe in a couple weeks or maybe a couple months, they might open this up again. So we'll that, just in time for our field trip in the little yellow bus. I don't know. So we get comfortable. And so this one, it covers the whole thing, kind of a 3D look. And that gives you the idea of how just immense the ceiling is. So we had to make scaffolding. And normally they would make scaffolding where they would bolt it into the side of the walls. But he used Brunelleschi's thing that he did for the dome to make scaffolding that can support itself. And what he did is he would get scaffolding all the way up to the top, and it's top. It's about six stories up, this massive vaulted ceiling. And just lay on his back on the scaffolding and paint by candlelight. Did he ever fall? He did fall. 
and other workers at fault. She had to carry everything up because while you're working, you have all what he's paying is all these other workers. As soon as they get done with the section, they come up there with the plaster and smear the plaster on, and he start painting again. He would do it all. Remember, we I showed you that one of the sketches he would make. He would do the sketches and put little holes on like trace holes, put that paper up, and then use paint to go over so it has little dots, and then paint over that. Because he had to get the paint out before the plaster pulled it off. But then the plaster would absorb the paint and just get this vibrant three-dimensional look. And so this one get pretty close, where you can see So Adam and Eve from the Christian and the Torah. How did I do that? I don't know what I did. There's Adam being created. That's Eve being created. So it's basically the story of Genesis. And it is remarkable. And you also figures, okay, he made him a little bigger, you know, kind of his attitude, you know, his idea, ideal person. But they're not exaggerating. But that's what we started here. Now then, we go back, after the Protestant Reformation had begun, and now there was an actual attack on Christianity, Julius was gone, he made this wall, and this is the last, the final, the last judgment. And here is Christ giving judgment to people going to heaven or hell. And you can see the terror in their faces as they go down or those that go up to heaven. And everyone in here is big and muscular and is very idealized. So he's giving his own impression and his own view, or they actually had a name for it called man. And so we're there, you can go, you, you kind of go through the crowd of people and you look, you look at that and they kind of look like this, and everyone's like this. And the thing is, they want no flash photography because flash degrades the picture. And so there's strict rules, and there are little stands, and there are these guards standing all the way around. So imagine a mob of people in this massive room, of, uh, bigger than gym, uh, a couple gym floors, just shoulder to shoulder, all, and they're taking pictures without flash, but it's hard to get a good picture because it's dark, and then you see a flash. So somebody took a flash, but you're hoping they get away with it. And those guards would start screaming at him in Italian, and they would literally run. I witnessed this, didn't walk on me, but they would walk on people's shoulders and dive on them and then drag them out. Really? And uh, it was exactly <laughs> It was one of those like, you gotta be kidding. And I'm glad it's over there. And then you see another flash over there, and then ah, boom, and they just dive into the crowd. So if you want some fun, use flash photography. Now, the Mona Lisa weren't convince, supposed to. Convince someone else with it, right? Yeah, that's the thing. And, uh, away from you, because they'll walk. They literally were walking on people to get there. At the Mona Lisa, they didn't enforce it. And so, you know, these are places. And I always say this: my wife and I are very frugal. We don't have children, so we we go to some of these places. Does that ever happened to you? Did anyone just did any guards tackle you with a flash? No. <laughs> I try not to take pictures, but that's the last judgment. It's spectacular. And this does not do it any kind of just, uh, justice. This is something that I always kind of like art, even though I have no artistic ability, I know that shocks you. But when you go to art museums and actually see it up close, you really realize, wow. This is so, it, the Vatican has so much art, so much welfare, it's kind of crazy. One of the smallest independent country in the world. About it. And so with that, this is the last judgment. What the words you have, you have to write everything down, just get mannerism. This is going to be called mannerism. So when the Renaissance would begin to adapt, artists started using their own interpretation of things. And they called it, it was like a unique touch or mannerism. So what are we doing? But now that's got to go away. Your phone's got to go away. Mm -hmm. I forgot my uh, notebook. Okay. So, so what are you doing? You're taking pictures. Yeah, okay. I'm taking pictures. Take pictures. All right. So with that, and 
they, they totally changed. And you notice something else. Remember the background scene? It's not back. It's empty. And so they're no longer worried about, you know, I'm going to show off my artistic work and get all that. There's more and more of this. No, what matters is here and my interpretation of it. So this is going to be called mannerism. And Michelangelo is an example of that. Yes, we have all the characteristics of Renaissance art, but you notice the exaggerated features. And these are people on their way down. Do you see it? And by the way, this is a very vindictive Christ and vindictive God, where the original was a loving God. He was mad at the Reformation. He was mad at Protestants. And so it's fascinating how you get, you can't escape it. Politics and life get in the way of everything. So let's get to the next artist, Raphael. Raphael was a friend of Michelangelo. And he was not as moody and difficult to work with. Part of the reason Michelangelo was moody is because he always had to paint and not do the sculpture like he wanted to. But in 1510, Raphael would do the classic example of his beautiful art called the School of Venice, the School of Athens. And what this is, is it's very secular. So it shows how things are changing. He did this at the Vatican, but these are Greek philosophers before Christianity. And so this shows that they're getting away from always having to do only what the church is. But you can see many of the elements of Renaissance art, can't you? Look at the lines. Then it goes, everything, right to them. And these are great philosophers, mathematicians. The idea is, you know, these are the ones who develop our society. Oh, and his buddy Michelangelo. Put him in there, too. It looks like he's been fitting a lot of Yeah, he's pondering how to get... Um, the, he's pondering the statue that lies within that block of marble. That's the way he looked at it. He's trying to figure out a math problem. It kind of is, but it's a different kind of math in a way. And so, for example, these are some of the people in there. Here's Da Vinci, Aristotle, Michelangelo. Raphael drew himself in the painting. Why not, right? You're going to be with all the grades. I'll put myself in it. He barely even knows it. It's a little bit subdued, but it's still there. And we've got Plato, Heaven's to the Ideal Man, Aristotle, look at the world now. That's pretty good, isn't it? Oh, I almost forgot. That's Plato, right? His model was Da Vinci. He drew Da Vinci as Plato. Which, why not for Plato? Why not, you know? Who else are you going to draw him at? Remember, uh, some of you might remember Pythagoras, the Greek philosopher. Well, Greek, but the big thing was the Pythagoras Society. They were obsessed with math. And do you remember, anybody remember what vegetable they were obsessed the with? Beans. beans. Yes, obsessed with beans. Why? And, why not? Beans are good. Beans re... Beans revitalize the ground they're in because they brought nitrogen into it. Oh, so no, beans no. was like a wondrous, wondrous vegetable fruit. Uh, Zoroaster, which is the uh, Mesopotamian leader, and that would be in what is present-day Iran and Iraq. And so this was the Persian. So those are your first semester. It was Persian. Ptolemy, and that's the Ptolemy of the Atlas. You notice the round earth right there. Euclid, what did Euclid do? Greek philosopher? What? So, uh, he did something. Anyone know? Geometry. Geometry. That's where most geometry comes. Are the basis of geometry when, when so I had to go to college, obviously, is well, the way life is. I have a math degree also. And I had to take a class just purely Euclidean geometry. No ruler, you had to do everything with a compass and a straight edge. You had to measure everything with a compass. So, but Raphael was really much in the natural setting for the most part. Oh, that School of Venice, it's much bigger than this wall. It's a massive painting. You kind of go around this little corner and like, wow! It was awesome. So my nephew lives near Rome. He, one, my one nephew, he's, he just turned eight. Time flies. So I want to go see him. That's why I have three nephews in Europe right now. He's near Portugal. 
Sevilla, please want to call it. He's a semester there. I've been my my wife's sister lives in Berlin, so I have a nephew there, and my brother's ex-wife. Stuff happens, but they live in. He's Italian. Just weird. And I'm from Montana. It's just kind of weird. It's a, it's a relatively small world, isn't it? But you can see motions, and the faces are a little bit of mannerism, but they're beautiful faces. And you can see by this valley that that Raphael drew. He was able to bring all. El Uh, kind of not so ugly. <laughs> At least it looks a little more realistic than what was going Yeah. Looks cute. Yeah, he looks cute. He doesn't look geeky. <laughs> I like that one day. That creepy nightmare. nightmare. Yeah. Why do somebody like did he go and dress up and look like not on my eyebrows? Eyebrows were seen as not attractive for women. So they would pluck them. You see women so far eyebrows today. Men do too, but more women. You know, they get like almost a thin line. Which I, I, I never really understood that it's, it's never looked good to, like, for example, me, but I know that's still a thing. It's just, it's just so like, that's one. It's just like eyes and then forehead. Well, the thing is, men are hairy, and women are going to be more pure and not. And of course, life is different for that. But what you will notice is we're not quite the mannerism. Look at that. Look at the detail on that house back there. That's where, I, that's where I grew up. Yes, it was like a manor house. Yes, it's not quite a house. Yeah, look at that. Oh, it's almost a church or has a, has a little rotunda. Yeah, it's not even a house. It's a lake. But isn't this, yeah, see the lake right there? Look at the fine detail in the background. And so he wanted to do more than just the Madonna and shop. And by the way, she's dressed as somebody would in 1500. Yes, it's about something from about 3 BCE, but he's not drawing it like that. He's drawing his world using religious characteristics. Just like even Michelangelo. He's still drawing to his point of view on what he sees the world. This is another very famous one, the Sistine Madonna. And so this is one that is... Um, this is also at the Vatican Museum, and that looks like a baby, doesn't it, for the most part? And it's pretty beautiful. I love the whole features of it, how the clothing, this is clearly 1500, a little bit of a building. I don't know why there's curtains, but clearly he wanted to <laughs> there be curtains out here. There's also two demons of the Oh, picture. look at the babies. They're cherubs. And these are going to become actually the most famous things that Raphael ever did. Are these two things? Every art museum I've ever been to, I think, sells the, the pictures of these two little babies, even though the painting's not there. They sell them because this is going to be—they're not these little creepy adult things. They're angels, but cherubs. And so. I don't think any of them look creepy. Yeah, with the little wings. I think they're really cool. But it looks like he had models for us. Almost certainly he did. Yeah. Probably you know, hard to keep a little baby still. I mean, no one give advice on how to do that. <laughs> but yeah, I mean, this is a. Isn't that cool? But you go anywhere. So um, all these museums, they'll have they'll sell this. So it's in the Metropolitan Museum of Art in New York City. It's not there. Yet yeah, then all these like the tote bags with those two on them. And people were scooping them up. Of course, a lot of people went there and thought they saw it, because you know they saw it. Sorry, I must have saw it. I'll buy that. But all of you have seen this, right? These two. I wouldn't surprise me. I know people have um, my wife's aunt has a, like this frame just at this. So it wouldn't surprise me at all. But you know how art is changing, and the background, we still have some, but it's starting a little mannerism here. Now, at the same time, there's a Northern Renaissance. And the Northern Renaissance had this weird combination of it. It's more Protestant, it's not the Protestant Reformation. And there's a lot more elements of secular life. Now, secular, 
outside the church and sectarian inside the church. I mean, they've been meshed completely. But there's going to be a, a change or a more gra um, embracing of humanism in the mid-1500s to the 1600s. The Netherlands is going to become um, for just tiny little parts of, of the Spanish Empire. I know it's weird, but I know when you look at the map here in Spain, they were all, this is all Spanish. They would fight a hundred year war to win their independence, but this could become the biggest merchant power in the world. Shipping, I mean, think of the Netherlands. They got to use shipping. So there's a lot of elements of wealthy nobility. And you know, even though they're going to have elements of Christianity in there, but it's also, look at what we're doing, humanism. So this is one of the most famous artists of this time. One of my favorites, Jean, Jan von Eck. Jan, Jan von Eyck. And the band is kind of like Vaughn for German. It's a nobility, German nobility. And um, Arnolfini and wife is one of the most famous portraits. It's right before they got married. By the way, she is not pregnant. It was very common for, for people at the wedding to um, the woman to simulate pregnancy, implying that that will um, for fertility. So that's what this is. It's just one of those things. But that is a, um, it shows his fine, both of them, their fine clothes, and he's showing off. The awesome hat, right? That's got to be the, one of the biggest hats I've ever seen. That, that, I've wear that everywhere. But then look at the work on the chandelier. And why spend the time on that? Or the mirror, and I'll get to the mirror in just a second. Wait, that's not that true. Those are, those look like, uh, you know those like play models that you find in the museum? Like wax, wax figures, yeah. Yeah, that's what they look like. They kind of do, don't they? Of course, you know, that's the way they paint. By the way, you may see the dog. It looks like a stuffed animal that's yeah. standing up right now. Of course, don't forget it's painted. Also, the one that looks like they have a horn on the on her head. Yeah, that's the one See this right here? That's the artist. Look at the chandelier. Candles, right? Now, there's the couple. And you see right there? That's Van Eyck. He painted himself into it in the middle. Like oh painting it. You got it. That's pretty cool. So this is in the, the Rijks Museum in Amsterdam. So here's another one. Von der Weiden, this is a, so this is a scene from the Gospels of Christianity. But you notice they're inside. Look at the clothes they're wearing. They're wearing very Dutch clothes from the 15th century. So yes, all focal lines lead here, but it's this. This is our world we live in now around a picture from the Bible. That's one of the things I like about it. If you get past, you know, you think, God, everything is everything is, is so geared towards religion. Do they ever think about anything else? Like, no, wait a second. They are thinking about their entire world and their belief system, their faith, and the world they live in. I think that's really cool. Yeah. Um, you know how you're saying the clothes that were normally painted were of like the 15th century? Mm -hmm. What clothes would they normally wear during the actual time? Well, the very wealthy would dress like that. So that's what they're painting. Yeah. So but most people imagine something very similar to that long dripping clothes, maybe occasionally pants, but bottom has just been invented a couple of years. Okay. Pants are just becoming even more used. Pants are much better to work in. I think you can understand why you get your dress caught, your long flowing cape caught, and things. Pants are much better. Of course, then again, that'd be completely wrong for women because it'd be so totally inappropriate, right? As all of you are. Okay. So look at that. Isn't that pretty amazing? I mean, look at the face. She's crying. You see the tears. And that's pretty remarkable. 
And then of course, ashen, just so sad that the colors went away from her face. So here's the money lenders. So Massey drew this, um, this painting, another in Amsterdam. And moment and look at the detail behind and then look at that coins and here the reflection of the window i think i got it how did he get such fine detail in his room? you literally and that's part of the thing where you use like porcupine twirl that's what you use that time now don't forget the painting is a lot bigger than that little screen but still i can't you know like is anyone a good artist in here or knows a good artist? You, are you good or cool? It's, it's amazing what they can do, the, the way they see the world. We all have our own ways to see the world. We do it in the age just artists are different. Same with really good musicians, that kind of, they just see the world in a different way than you do, or I do, yeah. How they can do it, wow. Uh, one of my best friends, in uh, graduate school, he was a, a very good artist. He's, still, he's now a professional artist in Los Angeles. He's a Canadian. I don't know why I had to add that part. But he would do art. He got bored of just drawing exact replicas of it. He just draw and just draw exact. So he did everything by looking at the model, and he would use uh, charcoal and not look at what he's drawing. He just let his hands move, and it was like the coolest thing ever. And he goes, "Yeah, I got bored just drawing exact replicas." Because he could literally just draw your face like this, just draw an exact. So, man in the turban, okay, I'm not saying you have to write this down. The point is you can see, look at the facial expression. Can't you see, I mean, you can see the elements of the turban. Heck of a lot different than medieval art. But then we get to Bruegel the Elder. And Bruegel the Elder is one of my favorite artists because he drew everyday life. And that's what I want you to get, just everyday life. <laughs> I need a drink. Sorry, going through a mask for a while. Damn. So these are all these Dutch parables and sagas of their life. And he drew regular people. Rubel the Elder is easily one of my favorite artists. It's a massive painting, so you really can see it. So let me show you a couple things about this. So you these magnificent paintings. They're really cool. So like the Tower of Babel, just all these fine details, little people working. Another story from the Torah or the Bible. Mad Meg, another one. So this is a really lovely valley. So this is a story, another biblical story about the story about Sodom and Gomorrah, a story that's in the Torah about it being destroyed. Yeah. That tower right there kind of looks like a human. No, all the brother. Yeah. Oh yeah, I know he drew that. He, he tried to show like the how decrepit it is. So you get here, you know, it's the fish eating a leg right here. Yeah, it's very surreal. It's almost look like something you'd see at the in the twentieth century. Yeah, the uh, top right of that picture kind of like a, a UFO sighting, but yeah. Well, let's get to the biggie. This is called Netherlandish Tro Proverbs. And this one goes through all these Dutch proverbs. And please work, please work. Yeah. And this one has all these proverbs from today. So you can see this painting. I have a refrigerator magnet of this thing. <laughs> don't like to brag. It's about this big. You don't see much, but it's still pretty cool. So these are properties of, so you see this painting right here? Let me go through this. So like here. Here is a woman cheating. Let me scroll down here so I can't read it. There's a saying in there called, she puts the blue cloak on her husband. She's cheating on her husband and puts that cloak on so we can't see. 
You could say it both ways because that happens, but that's one. There's another one going down. So all of these are in this painting. That, see it right here? So let me give you another one. To bang one's head against a brick wall. You ever seen that? Yeah. He is literally banging his head against a brick wall. Do you know what that saying means? I can keep, okay. Here's another one. Move like you're, I think you know, and it's literally on fire. I mean, it's a really funny painting. Here's one shear sheep, the other shear is pigs, meaning they have the wool and you're trying to get wool off of a pig. That's a pig, see, snout. It depends on the fall of the car or let the chips fall. May, you ever heard that, let the chips fall? Is that an eye on the wall? Yeah. That's from another one. <laughs> There's all these proverbs. I, I think this is fun. Two fools under one hood, meaning stupidity loves company. Which, have you noticed that? That seems to happen. Dumb people multiply together. Moving on. But see the face. It looks like the... Uh, In know, one, there's one hood, they're together. You know those, like, uh, like ceramic mats, like clay mats that have oh, like, sure. different expressions? Yeah, that's so, from... Those faces free. just remind me of those. It does. So, I think you know what that means. And he's literally going to the bathroom into the wind and it's going against the house. <laughs> oh, yeah, they're earthy. <laughs> <laughs> That's in the painting. Yes, sometimes there'll be holes in there. The blind leading the blind, both will fall in the ditch. You ever heard the blind leading the blind? Yeah. Yeah. Swim against the current. You've heard that one, right? Oh, no, 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 this. Two dogs, one bone. My grandma used to say that all the time. Don't be impatient sitting on hot coals. <laughs> Literally sitting on hot coals. I like to think that's the, uh, the precursor of the one where he's running with uh, yeah, I know. Yeah. fire. He's rear on fire. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Cloak against the wind, basically to shift your current, your belief. Let's see a couple more. I mean, these are great. The whole world is turned upside down. Yeah, that was pretty common. The orb don't represent the earth. Remember, they all. Blues for water. To have roof tiles with tarts. A, a little pie. Uh, to between two stools and the ashes. Can't make his mind up. Uh, too bad they don't say to, to be able to tie even the devil to a pillow. <laughs> that seems a little complex. Yep, to despise everything. There's a lot of earthy stuff. You ought to see what Martin Luther would do. His things about against the Catholic Church. It is the most, wow. <laughs> a pillar biter is a hypocrite. You say you believe in certain things about religion and then you, go, and then you act a different way. That is hideous. I kind of like it. To lead each other by the nose, that's, I've heard that one before. And got the world spinning on your thumb, the world in your hand. So did you like it? So that's Bruegel. Let me give you one more scene and let's watch oh, a couple more. We got the harvester. So you have that same technique, but it's everyday life. Children's games, you got little kids playing games here. Everyday life. The peasant dance, those are just so cool. Bruegel is awesome. Peasant wedding. Okay, you found out that I like Google. Yeah. I met him. He's a good guy. Well, you were alive here. But Bosch is one of the most amazing artists. 
So as you have this element of perspective, what Bosch did is turn it into a cautionary note. We have all these changes in society, what are we going to do with it? So Bosch would make these series of like, you want these delights on earth, but hell is coming. And so all these ghastly things about people enjoying themselves, they can do whatever they want, and what is coming, this ghastly creature. And they are like the things of nightmares, Bosch. Bosch is just, that's all we need is just Bosch. And so for example, that's one of the more famous ones of people. Basically, it's, an, it's a centerpiece. And so you fold this, you open it up, it stands here in the middle and here and now um, on both sides. And the idea is what kind of world are we going to have where we have all these different people just searching for their own personal pleasure and greed. And you're going to have these various, I mean, look at the creepy monster right here. But do you notice it's all in perspective, though? But it's his imagination. All these creatures here. There's the world, but it's on uh, this strange, deformed world. This is the world we're going to live in. And then it comes back to, this is Christianity. So that is Jesus. And what side are you going to be on? Yeah. yeah Where's that? Uh, right by the red. What do you see? Human skull. Let me get right here and stuff. Oh, yeah. And you notice all the weird poses, all the things going on. It's good. Bosch is pretty amazing. Yeah, I like that one. <laughs> what is that? Do you notice the face? Yeah, the giant ear. Is that a... I guess it's a feather? No, it looks like two giant ears, only like a kitchen knife or something. Yeah, but I think it's, I don't know. Uh, I think that white creature is supposed to be like a Peter Griffin hat. I think it's armed with like. I think you're right. Because that's what it looks like. I saw a face. Here's the last judgment. You see like chaos on earth and then the judgment. So it's a kind of a different version of what we saw from Michael Angela. Just a confused, just looks so. And then a little bit more. Folly, if, if you believe um, the kind of mocking people who think they can have all the answers, and um, what, what is the cure? What is he doing? A little minor surgery here. So, let's get to this then. Yeah, it looks like he's wearing a funnel on his yeah, head. Yeah, funnel on his head. When I first saw that, when I was going back through it again, I thought, why did they have it look like the Tin Man from The Wizard of Oz? <laughs> That's exactly right. Yeah. yeah. It's the Tin Man. So, let's get to this then. I'm saving this till now. Remember, we watched the babies one, right? Why, <laughs> nice plus, <laughs> We've all been there. After a long day at work, you sit down and binge read some Arthurian romances. They're called illuminated manuscripts because they're illuminated with illustrations in the borders, colorful drawings, and very special doodles in the margins. But among all those steroidal rabbits and this hooded person laying literal eggs, there's actually a theme. A lot of medieval knights in these manuscripts are fighting snails. Why is this happening? The largest snail alive is 15.5 inches, snout to tail. So why does this knight look like he's in for the fight of his life? Illuminated manuscripts were handwritten Scribes painstakingly transcribed the same Bibles, devotionals, and stories. They also decorated the margins. By the 1960s, one scholar thought these margins were worth attention. Lillian Randall was particularly intrigued by the snail in Gothic marginal warfare, 
She developed a theory about why a book like this might include a winged knight fleeing snails, and why it showed up again and again and again. Randall found more than 70 snail fighting heroes in just 29 manuscripts, most of which were made between 1290 and 1310. Pray for yourself, knight. Pray that the snail will kill you quickly. Sometimes the margins riffed on the text, sometimes they were disconnected, but Randall connected them to historical stereotypes. The biggest was that the Lombards were greedy, mean, and cowardly. The Lombards were a Germanic people that had invaded Italy. They were warriors. But in 772, they were badly beaten by Charlemagne. That permanently stained their reputation. By the late 1200s, when those snail pictures started getting popular, the Lombards had become lenders and pawnbrokers spread throughout Europe. They didn't have full rights. They couldn't even own arms, but they did have power. That combination of power and impotence, Randall argued, made them targets. Snail was the appropriate insult. Snails carried their houses on their backs as they retreated, just as the Lombards had from Charlemagne. They were slimy, like a lot of Europeans probably saw their lenders. Calling Lombards snails was an anti-foreign slur that later grew into a bigger trope. It appeared in what was probably a medieval pattern book, with models that helped other scribes draw. And snails showed up in many different combinations later on. Here's a snail monkey rabbit battle royale from the 1400s. Snails were slow, but they spread. We can't be certain what the knights and snails meant because they meant different things as the image became a cliche. The same way people don't explain their memes today, scribes didn't annotate their games in the margins. Randall's argument fits with the timing and history, but people also speculate that snails represented the slowness of time or the insulation of the ruling class. We can only be certain about one thing. The snails reveal something along with everything else in the margins. As scribes labored over transcriptions of hallowed works, reproducing every line, they snuck in additions, jokes, and riffs in the margins of the text. The drawings were fantasies, but they were made by artists who sought to parody the indignities and absurdities of their own world. The margins were the only space left. So they turned them into a self-portrait. Except for this guy. He's just going to get murdered by a snail. So this video just scratches the surface when it comes to weird medieval art and possible interpretations. Michael Camille wrote a whole book about art in the margins, and he highlights one figure. It's the gorillas, and he's supposed to represent bodily appetites. It's very cute and a little disgusting. Like so you're going. So, your place to stop right there. And just a sec. So I assigned 12.3, and I originally, originally thought about doing it today, but I'm going to make 12.3 do on. So I said it earlier, I'm going to make it do on Monday. So I gave you that list. Most of you who got, I gave everyone that list in session 12. I'm going to ask a little matching quiz on. Everyone got that? So it's a world history, so the blue book, or the, the hardcover book, hardcover. I don't know if that's all that issue. I was going to show you something, I can't find you.
Okay, here we go. Here we take a quick peek up a little water. Rabbits were cool back then. So what's new on Monday? 12-3 on the Reformation. There'll be, how many questions? What, 30? Six. Five. How about eight? Sure. Eight better than 30? Just be a little matching voice. No questions. Just a question. No questions. I gave you that little book. Yeah. There's that 14 term that will be you. You know what I did. Oh no, I accidentally read it. You read the sign? Sorry. <laughs> There's a sign there? Oh my god. Huh? Yeah. 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 It says there's a sign there? Yeah. Private. Don't read it. Private. But you just read it to me. Ah!